we are going to begin with a look at propositions 30 and 38. They kind of go together and we will, they're different, but they deal with the same issue and we will answer your question at the end, what happens if they both pass? So don't worry about that, we'll get to that. But for the moment, we want to take a look at Proposition 30, which says temporary taxes to fund education. Proposition 38 also tax to, to, um, to fund education. Well, right now the way it is, is California's budget is about $16 billion. Is that over? We're under, we're, that's unfunded, correct? That's what it is now. And that assumes that Prop 30 or 38 would bring money in. So even if we bring, even if one of these two propositions passes, I think this is correct, brings money in, are we still going to be $16 billion over or will that budget gap be closed? It'll be closed. Da-da. So we're looking to co cover that budget gap by passing either Proposition 30 or 38. If neither pass, that budget gap remains. Okay. There's also, uh, there's also $2.5 billion transfer from other accounts and about $8 billion in spending cuts, and that's the way the current budget is. All right. Now, what would Prop 30 versus 38 do? We have the next slide. Brown's plan, Governor Brown is Prop 30. The Munger plan is Prop 38. Governor Brown would be, that would be a constitutional amendment. I have a question right away. Constitutional amendments have to pass by what percentage? Majority. Just majority. So it's, these are simple majorities, even though it's a constitutional amendment. The Brown plan would increase sales tax by one quarter of 1% for four years. Right now it's at 7.25%, so it will go up to 7.5%. That's the state sales tax. I believe there's local sales tax on top of that. And so there's sales tax increase. And it would also increase personal income tax on the wealthier. So if you're earning 500000 there, it's I believe this is for single, double. So if, you, if you're a couple and you're bringing uh, down half a million bucks, good for you. <laughs> and, um, and But if this passes for the next seven years, your tax rate would go from 9.3% up to 12.3%. If you're a single filer, it would take two and half of that quarter, uh, 250000 okay? Now that's governor's plan. So it's both sales tax increase and income tax increase for the wealthier folks in California. And by the way, that the wealthy in that category is, the, is like 1% of the population. So if anyone's in that 1%, please raise your hand. We'll, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get all friendly with you. <laughs> now, the Munger plan, Molly Munger, has a different idea. She does not want to raise any sales tax. So the sales tax, the state sales tax would say it's 7.25. She wants to increase income tax, however, but on more people. Her income tax increase would last for 12 years and it would impact not 1%, but more like 60% of all income tax filers. And it wouldn't go up quite as much. It would go up to 11.5% on the top tier instead of 12.3%, all right? So the big difference here is Governor Brown, Prop 30, sales tax is, is, is hiked. And on Molly Munger's or Prop 38, it's only income tax increase, but on a greater percentage of Californians. Okay? All right. The next one. How much would this bring in? Prop 30 would bring in between $8.5 billion, $7.7 .7 billion dollars, just in the first uh, fiscal year there, 2012 to 2013, it would go to the general fund and it would be subject to Prop 98 requirement for education. Prop 98 is that proposition that guaranteed that a certain percentage of the budget would go to education. So the money would go to the general fund and be subject to Prop 98, which means that go to the general fund but we be funneled through Prop 98 into the schools. Now Prop 98 is really complicated but so some people say there's no guarantee it'll go to the schools. But generally that's what would happen. It would go into the general fund through Prop 98 to the schools. The Munger plan would generate 5.6, a little bit less in the same amount of time. And the funds would go into California Education Trust Fund more directly. That's why she's saying we, we, we can guarantee for sure that Prop 38, the money would go to the schools. It would go directly into the California Trust Fund to be sent on K through 12 early education. Now I also have to say that Prop, back to Browns, that Prop 98 would distribute the money not just to K through 12, but into higher education as well. So the money would go to wider span, K through college, including community colleges, UC and, and Cal State and so forth, all right? 
So kind of, they both do education, but slightly differently. All right. So remember that, what was it, $16 billion deficit that's sitting there that they're hoping will be closed if taxpayers vote for 30 or 38? Well, what would happen if it doesn't? We'll go to the next slide. The spending reductions, if Prop 30 fails, schools and community colleges would be hit by, with a $5.3 billion cut, and you can just look right down the line, University of California, California State University, Department of Developmental Services, City Police Develop uh, Department Grants, CAL FIRE, um, DWR, what's DWR? Anyone know? Department of Water Resources, thank you. Water Safety, Fish and Game, Parks and Recreation, and Department of Justice, that's our courts, all would be hit by additional cuts, these are additional to what they've already suffered and they've already been cut quite a bit. So that's why they say that, that's why Governor Brown and everyone's saying, oh my goodness, California's gonna go off a cliff if we don't pass either Prop 30 or 38, and of course he is in favor of Prop 30. But what do the pro supporters and opponents say? Well, for Prop 30, they say it's the only measure that protects school and safety funding and helps state's chronic budget mess. They say the taxes are temporary, if there is such a thing in California. Opponents say it's a shell game, there's no assurance the tax increase will benefit schools because of that complicated Prop 98 formula, which I understand only about three people in all of California truly understand. And Prop 30 continues to, continues out of control spending and does not make meaningful reforms. That's Prop 30. Nevertheless, it's supported by, next slide, Governor Brown, University of California, of course, uh, the Service Employees International Union, that's the big um, union for, is it state or a local? Um, it's national? Yeah. International, um, but it's municipal employees, right? State and municipal? It's all over. All over, okay. <laughs> Teachers Unions, California Association of Hospitals and Democratic Party opposing it, National Federation of Independent Business, California Small Business Association, Howard Jarvis, you can read those here, there yourself. And now to Prop 38, the Molly Munger, the one that did not have the sales tax, that had only the income tax, but affected a lot more people. Supporters for that one say, says Prop 38 makes schools a priority because the money would go directly into schools. And they say the schools could use the funds in different ways and they have more local control. Opponents say the taxpayers are locked into higher taxes until 2024, because the tax increase applies to a longer period of time, and that there's no accountability as to how the money is spent and there are no requirements to improve school performance or get rid of bad teachers. That, to me, is a little bit off the subject. <laughs> so, 38, finally, is supported by Molly Munger. I don't know a lot about her, but I know that she or her husband have a whole lot of money, and so this is almost a, um, a, almost a personal, personally uh, supported um, measure. Um, also has support from California State PTA, school boards, advancement project, education trusts, et cetera, and the op what's an insurance company doing in it? Anyway, <laughs> opposition is California Chamber of Commerce, Faculty Association, California Democratic Party, and the Medical Association. So that's an overview of those two, and I would love some advice from our panelists about what do you think the strengths and weaknesses are of one or the other, and we'll begin with uh, Dr. Wallace. When you do polling, most people actually are more willing to have a slight increase in the sales tax than in the other tax. And the ways the Proposition 30 is framed, it's, it provides increased income taxes only on basically the top 1%. So I, all of us would pay a little bit through sales tax, um, and probably none of us would pay anything through income tax. Uh, Prop 38, most people don't like their income taxes going up. Uh, so that's sort of the, the basic difference in the revenue generation. California sales tax is interesting, though, because compared to other states, it's a very narrow tax. So, for example, in California, you don't pay sales tax on food. You don't pay sales tax on medicines. You don't pay sales tax on services. Mm -hmm. You don't pay sales tax when you go to the movies. So even sort of average everyday people pay a relatively small proportion of their income in, in, in sales taxes. Um, in terms of California sales tax. Tax, food's not taxed, for example. Yeah. There are certain things that aren't taxed through sales tax, but other things are. Yeah. And on, I'm here to speak to how this might impact seniors in particular and other vulnerable populations. And I think any increase in anything that seniors have to pay is going to be detrimental. I mean, it's something that is very concerning given that most seniors are on a low, 
on a fixed income. Now, at the Roy Ball Institute, we focus on very low income uh, minority seniors. And they, this is a very vulnerable population in Los Angeles. Los Angeles County as a whole has the largest number of seniors in the entire state of California. And so I think when we talk about increasing any tax of any kind, whether it's income or sales tax, we really do need to uh, be mindful of the fact that there are large numbers of people who are already living on the edge, who are already living paycheck to paycheck, if you will, or doubling up, or moving in with families, or going into nursing homes because they can't afford to pay their expenses as they are. Regardless of whether there's a sales tax on medication or not, they can't afford their medication, right? So I think that we need to be mindful of the fact that some of these propositions will benefit some of us, but either one could be detrimental to certain groups. So it really is, does it benefit you personally? Is it more de detrimental to larger communities? Um, I think my biggest message is even though we're talking mostly about education, and again, we'll talk more about that, um, in terms of increasing funding for education. Of course, with 30, there's no guarantee. Um, with 38, there is a guarantee, but there are other concerning issues around 38. Um, but older adults cannot divorce themselves from a conversation around education, because education is very important, even if you're an older adult and you're not currently in school. Um, but there is long life learning, and the older adults will go back to school. It will affect their children and their grandchildren, and I think, so education is good. Anytime we want to increase funding for education, it's like puppies, everybody loves puppies. So we always <laughs> want to give money to, for education. I think it's really important, but at what cost? You know, at what cost? And I think that's really the issue here, given the fact that millions upon millions of dollars have been cut for services for seniors. And there's no discussion about how that general fund money will be used toward restoring some of those services when we're looking at millions of seniors increasing in the next uh, decade. Thank you. Tom, what do you, how do you size up both of these and weaknesses and strengths? Well, I'd like to just add some details. Going to Karen's point, it's right that everyone hurts when it comes to taxes, but some, some people have done some estimates that for the sales tax impact, if you're in the bottom fifth of the economic scale in California, the sales tax impact is likely to be $24 which if you're really poor, $24 counts as much as anything else. But if you're in the middle range of making running around forty to $60,000 in your household, the impact would likely to be about $55. Is that a year, a month, or? A year. A year. Because again, I mean, it's a quarter of a percent and it's not on everything that you buy. So I think that's an important perspective. I think also, I would clarify, there is protection under Prop 30 that the money will go education because they do also set up an education protection account so that the monies from Prop 30 go into this account and from there directly to the schools um, and it's not subject to the legislature um, and, but it also has a beneficial effect I think for the senior group because while it, it it goes to education it has the side effects the way the budget works is that it's relieving the state general fund of certain kinds of expenditures which allows the general fund to pay for other things like senior services or, or the courts or a lot of other things that our society needs. So it, it is, someone might have to pay $24 or $55 but they have a higher chance of getting some services out of the funding that comes out of the whole pot. And something over 80% of it comes out of the income tax side which is hitting that that 1%. So I think you have to kind of try to balance all that um, in, in trying to make a judgment. Dr. Lincoln focused on the elderly. Um, Dr. Wallace, do you have a sense of which one might be beneficial or not so beneficial to the elderly population? I think if you look at the tax burden, it's probably a wash. If you look at the tax benefits, where the money is going to go, um, my sense would be that 30 is more likely to benefit senior services. So mm -hmm. the way that 38 is structured, it can only go for this trust fund for education and um, the various types of budget pressures in the state won't change as a result of that. We've seen over the last five years, starting with the recession, uh, cutback in programs like caregiver resource centers and nutrition programs and long-term care programs. Um, there's a whole set of programs that the state has tried to cut that it hasn't been able to yet in home supportive services that are continuing under pressure. And Mr. Carson, what happens if both of them pass? 
Well, they each have provisions in them. If they both pass, Prop 30 says if it gets more votes, then nothing in 38 will apply at all. It'll oh, just be so if Prop 30 it. passes, <laughs> Prop 38 is dead. If it passes with more votes than 38 passes. More votes than 38. Okay, okay so 30 <laughs> can kill off 38. Right. If okay. 38 passes, it's absolutely clear that the income tax and sales tax provisions of 30 would not be would not be impacted. Uh, you mean would go away? I mean, uh, they would go away. Okay. They would not be affected. They okay. would just be totally cut out. Now, there are other parts of 30 which weren't mentioned in your summary. For example, uh, there's a, they put in the Constitution a guarantee that the certain programs that the state had passed down to counties and localities regarding the prisons and parole and that sort of thing, it, would, it guarantees funding to those programs but it's not through a tax increase, it's allocating existing taxes. So the argument is, even if 38 passed with more votes, those should not be impacted, although some of the proponents of 38 have said, oh yes, they will. So there will <laughs> undoubtedly be litigation, but it's, it's less clear and less logical that it, it would be impacted. So if 30 passes or gets more votes than 38, then 38 is dead. If 38 gets more votes than 30, then the tax and income tax provisions of 30 are dead, but there's that smaller uh, provision that lives on. And there's also, the money. yeah, and there's also the, you mentioned the cuts. The cuts are not in the proposition, they're in the budget. But if those Prop 30 revenues are not, do not go into effect, either because they, you know, didn't get a majority or they didn't get the highest number of votes, then those cuts would go into effect. So even if 38 could pass with its income tax increase, but the budget would cut that $6 billion dollars uh, because those are trigger cuts that are already passed as part of legislation, right? They're yeah. not part of these propositions, correct? correct? Correct, So are you saying that even if Prop 30 or 38 passed, there's certain trigger cuts that are occurring? No. If 30, no, if 30 passes with the more, most votes, then that's fine. Those that's trigger fine. cuts do not happen. Very good, okay. Who is Molly Munger and why did she write uh, Prop 38? Or why is she write and support Prop 38? And this Molly Munger, for, is, she, is she local? I think she's local. Uh, she's from Northern California oh, somewhere. Okay. She, she Northern and her, okay. her brother Charlie, who I mentioned also funds a lot of these, are the children of Charles Munger Sr., who was the partner or is the partner in Buffett in, in founding Ber Berkshire Hathaway. So, so their they are, father. They are, the father has a billions, billions and billions of dollars. And billions and if Prop 30 or 38 passes, will it cost money to implement the new laws? So we're talking about sales tax and, in and income tax. Well, I can't swear there'd be no incremental cost, but I mean, you basically have a, an, you know, a structure to collect income tax and, and sales tax, so they might have to hire a few more people to handle another $10 billion or something, but you know, basically the structure's in place. Explain the state cuts to seniors. What is a trigger? What is a trigger? So trigger. when... When the legislature passed the budget back last June, what they said is we assume that the governor's uh, revenue increases will occur. So our spending is for X amount of dollars. If the revenue comes up short, meaning his proposal of Prop 30 does not pass, then they're, they've already written into law, if this does not pass, we will back out or we will cut programs to compensate for the revenue that we would have received. So that's why, <clears throat> so I have a personal stake in this, full self-disclosure, I'm an employee of the University of California. <laughs> um, so yeah. the university knows if 30 does not pass, if 38 passes, it doesn't matter. If 30 does not pass with the most votes, the University of California will be cut $200 million. So that's it's already a, those in law. Cuts are that's already, that's, ready that's already to go. guaranteed. Nothing has to happen except Prop 30 not pass. So those wow. are the trigger cuts. Uh, California State is 250 million, K through 12, you know, and so on and so forth. Is that forth. the list we saw? Yeah. Oh, so those so are the trigger, they're called trigger cuts because nothing has to happen, it's automatic. Could the state still make more cuts in the budget if Prop 30 passes? So that budget gap would be closed, but could they still cut the budget? I guess they could. They always have that ability, yes. <laughs> Not inclination. No. <laughs> But no, no, yeah, but there's nothing can, stopping them from cutting the budget. That's they true. They can cut it anytime, anytime, anywhere. But but if they have the money, they very seldom. 
The only time they really cut is when they're under pressure, I think, by a deficit to cut. It's not, it's not like, oh, we have $16 billion. Okay, let's see, oh, let's like, cut some more. I mean, if, if they have a balanced budget, they're going to stop there. They're not going to take willingly make more cuts. What is the maximum income that will not be subject to a tax increase in Prop 38? Has everybody gotten this publication in the mail yet? It's yeah. The, yeah. So yeah. they actually have in here a nice little table, because it's a complicated proposition, that uh -huh. says what is the increase in your income tax, because it, the lowest amount is a half a percent increase in the total amount of tax, and then it goes up. But what's the income level that subject, that's subject to so that? So it starts at $7,000 for a single person. $7,000 for a single person? Yeah, that's no a lot way. of money. Um, so if I'm earning $7,000 as a single person, I would be subject to this Prop 38 tax, yep. albeit a very tiny amount. Very small, but yep. yes. That's a taxable income. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was much higher than that. No. Yeah. So, so, so if I earn $7,000 of taxable income, I would be subject to an increase under Prop 38, albeit a tiny increase. A half a percent. Okay, and then how, like, um, what is, say, let's take the average, what is, say, someone is earning 40000 so if you're $7,000, your current tax rate for the state is 2%, it will go up to 2.4. Yeah, that's kind of a lot, If actually. you're 40000 your current tax rate is 8, it'll go up to 9.4. And what's the average income for seniors? Do you know, more or less? In the, is it in the 20s or 30s? Yeah, it's a, I think it's it, it varies. Yeah. yeah, so let's say like 30000 What would 30000 be? So 30000 currently taxable income. Taxable. Um, it's Not gross. Six, taxable. it'll go up to 7.1. <gasps> Six to seven point, that's kind of a lot. Wow, okay, good question. Because I was just thinking, well, that, well, I thought it was going to affect people at higher levels. I didn't think that even someone with $7,000 of tax yeah. income would be affected like by said, this. You know, this is, this is actually the legislative analyst who's nonpartisan writes the basic information, so it's a good nonpartisan. And then they have the for and against arguments, which gives you the, the partisan parts. So Very interesting, very good question. Yeah, by the state of California, good resource, also available online. Good. And I don't work for the Department of State, so I'm not just <laughs> for that. This question is for Mr. Carson. We passed Prop 98. That's the um, proposition that guaranteed a certain amount of the state budget go to education. But education funding was still cut and or borrowed by the state. What would prohibit this from happening if Prop 30 passes, as we kind of alluded to earlier? Well, both of these propositions have special accounts set up. They, ma they mandate the 30 is called the Education Protection Account. Prop 38 has the Education Protection Trust, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, the dollars that arise from these propositions, whichever one applies, goes directly into this separate account and then is deliberately distributed from that account to the designated recipients. So it can't be affected by a subsequent budget by the legislature or it can't be borrowed. It's, it's mandated in the, in the law of the proposition and the language of the proposition that it goes directly, um, you know, th through this channel directly to the recipients, the school districts or the community college districts and so forth. So the question is, is there any guarantee that money from Prop 30, if Prop 30 passes, is there any guarantee that the money will flow properly yes, because, to Yes, by the terms of this education okay. protection account, um, okay. it, it has to go to that account and from there to the school district. Okay, very good. Does this measure define fiscal emergency? Oh, yeah, remember this is the one that would allow the governor to actually make cuts during a fiscal emergency? And could the governor's cuts be overridden by a two-thirds vote in the legislature? Aha. Uh -huh. Anybody know the particulars of that from Prop 31? First of all, does it define fiscal emergency? Or does the definition of fiscal emergency stay the same? Because right now, a fiscal, I think there is a a definition or criteria by which a fiscal emergency can be called. Is that correct? It's my understanding. I don't know what the exact terms of that are. I don't know if there's any terms in 31 that define fiscal emergency. They might leave it as is. Okay, let's see here. Governor may, the, may, the governor may declare a fiscal emergency and call the legislature into special session if he or she determines the state is facing large revenue shortfalls or spending overruns. So I guess it sounds like it's somewhat at the governor's discretion when he or she determines that we're looking at a large revenue shortfall or spending overruns, they can 
the governor can call fiscal emergency. I'm sure right. there, there's some kind of there's standards. There's more stand. Yeah, it's more specific than that. But there are standards. It sounds like those standards remain, and that they they're not changed by. From what I understand, they're not changed by Prop 31. Okay, so those fiscal emergency criteria, the fiscal emergency criteria stay the same. Now, the next part of the question is, could the governor's cuts made during a fiscal emergency be overridden by two-thirds vote in the legislature? Is that mentioned at all in Prop 31, or do his cuts stay? No, they stay. They stay. So this fiscal emergency, the power of the governor to cut during a fiscal emergency is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty sharp knife, and it has to, and the, and the cuts remain. They can't, the, the legislature can't intercede with a two-thirds vote. Okay. How would the two-year budget cycle sync with assembly members' two-year terms? Oh, interesting. And state senate six-year terms? Are they staggered or simultaneous? Good question. So the two-year budget plan, when would that start so that it would be in sync with the two remember. with the terms? Or not? I guess it doesn't even say when it would start? It does. It, it identifies, and I don't remember right now whether it says it's every odd numbered year or even numbered years, but it's they, they specify in which year it is. And I, I just, I, when I looked at it, I didn't connect it with assembly. But this is a good question here. because you're right. Yeah. You know, yeah. because do you want the, you know, if you, otherwise you've got a change, a possible change in your assembly person in the middle of a, of a, of a budget year. Good question, boy. Smart we stumped the here. panel. <laughs> <laughs> Give, give that person a cookie. Yes, <laughs> really. Very, very good question. We'll try to find the answer for you, but yes. 